Okay, our subject today is confined space entry. Why do we spend as much time as we do on this? Every year in December, we'll go out and we do confined space and, and trenching safety training as a regional tour around the state. We've taught thousands of different people about this subject, um, and we continue to talk about it every year. Why is, this the, why is this such an important subject? Well, because your life is on the line when you're dealing with confined spaces um, or trenching. Uh, and so in this training, we, we've, uh, we've noted that there are a lot of people that will attend our regional trainings, but there may be a number of people that don't get this training because of location where they are or one, one thing or another, they can't get away from that class. We wanted to have this available as a webinar so we can, so we can push that out to those groups that may not have that. Um, but uh, realize that we will be doing this class in December and it will be much more in depth. Um, this, is, this is intended to be the 45 minute webinar. And so I've got to talk really fast to get through this. This is a condensed version to help people understand what they're facing when they, when they deal with this um, issue of, of confined space entry, but, uh, but realize that there's a lot more to it than, than what might be presented here today. We'll give you the nuts and bolts, um, but the actual implementation, let's sit down and talk about that, help you, help you with your program if you, if you need something. If you've got a good program there, use this as a, as a reminder and also to maybe look at your program and see if there's something that you may have missed. All right, so let's dive in and talk about what the, what the issue is with confined spaces um, and with some statistics. Rescuers, um, rescuers are account for a huge portion of those fatalities that happen in confined spaces. Why is that? Because people see a problem happening and they want to go and help their friend. There's nothing wrong with the desire to help somebody that's in, in danger or, or, or has had an accident. The problem is, is people don't understand the risk that they put themselves when they dive in. Um, other statistics, 65% of confined space fatalities are due to a hazardous atmosphere. Um, that could be low oxygen, which is one that we've seen very commonly, but it could also be a toxic. It could be something like carbon monoxide or hydrogen sulfide that's in that space. The problem is, um, in many fatalities, 139 deaths that OSHA investigated, they found that they didn't use a detector, gas detector, or ventilation. Those two simple things can reduce, it can eliminate probably 65% of confined space fatalities. Um, it's simply knowing what, it, what you're getting into and providing clean air <clears throat> into that confined space are so essential. Um, of course, the, the permit entry system, all of that is really important, but those two things, if we're doing that, we, we prevent a ton of those, uh, of those deaths that can happen. A third of all the deaths that happen are supervisors. So just because you've moved up the food chain a little bit doesn't necessarily mean that you are immune from dying in a confined space. Here's an interesting statistic. 25% of, of those spaces were toxic before entry when somebody, somebody died in that space. I like to throw statistic, turn statistics on their head and say, well, what about the 75% of the time that something changed while they're in there? A lot of times we think about that, well, 25%, that means they didn't, they didn't test, they didn't, they didn't ventilate, yep. 75% of the time when a fatality occurs, something changed when they're in the space. That, and many times that's something that we do to ourselves. We start a motor, um, we, we get out a chemical. Um, Doug and I came on a, on a situation that could have been really bad years ago. Um, we went up to take a, look at a, take a look at a water tank that was just about to, to be completed construction and, uh, and down in southern Utah, we were in the area and said, we're going to ensure this uh, tank, so let's go take a look. So we drive up, and as we get to this space, here's a couple of, uh, a couple of guys, and they were pretty young, probably in their, in their late teens, early 20s, standing outside of an open vault, two hatches open, and these guys have got their hands on their knees, and they're gasping for air. <clears throat> and, as we, and as we pulled up, we, we said, what's going on, guys? And they're like, we just about didn't get out of there. And they're gasping for air. And uh, Doug and I take a look down in this vault. And it's a simple concrete box. 
with a with a, uh, a pipe going through it. And it was a meter vault where where it would meter the amount of water that's going out of the tank. And uh, but we saw an interesting thing down in this vault, and it was a can of lacquer thinner. These guys had been told by their boss, the contractor that was building the tank, to uh, go down in the tank and and wire brush off this <laughs> this pipe and prep it for paint and paint the pipe so it doesn't rust. Well, what they what they ended up doing was taking a gallon of lacquer thinner and pouring it all over the place, and they were just about overcome by the vapors. I'm just glad that they didn't uh, didn't cause a spark down in there because they might have been burned to death. Anyway, it was it was as close as as close as we've we've ever come, and as and that we ever want to come to a confined space fatality in person. And uh, we want to prevent these things. It's simple, but the things that we do in those spaces can kill us. All right, so just a, just a couple of reminders before we start out. Um, always protect yourself first. Stand back and think and look at the space. We talk about the rule of thumb, where you hold your thumb out at arm's length, and if you can cover the scene, that's a good place to start looking and asking yourself questions about the safety of this. When in doubt, get out. If something isn't right in that space, you start getting lightheaded or something like that, get out of that space and figure out what's going on. Let's take the time to do it right. Okay? This is your life at stake. Whatever it is that that job is, is not important enough that you want to put your life at stake. Take the time to do it correctly. All right, just ask you a question and for those of you that, um, we're on before we started. Um, I threw this out to start with. What is what is the confined space that you get into most of? At most? Um, and type this into this. I've got to can't pull up that chat box for some reason. I can't see my chat box. Um, what is the confined space that you get into the most often? Uh, what does it look like? Is it a PRV vault? Um, is it a sewer, a sewer manhole? Let's see, Dave says it's manholes. Um, for the average, if I were if I were to say, and I could I, I could quiz Doug and Brent as well, but when I go out uh, when I go out and I talk to people about the confined spaces they get into, generally it's going to be a pressure uh, a pressure um, PRV or pressure regulating vault. Um, where they're getting out in just to check something or to turn a valve or, or to make sure everything's working, working right, but that changes from place to place. Is there a confined space that scares you? Um, is, there a, is there a place it's like storm drain boxes um, have been brought up? Is there a space where you constantly find a low oxygen state or you find hydrogen sulfide or something like that? You ask yourself, is, boy, I've got to do everything right when I get into this space. Okay. Well, we've got a couple of suggestions there. We ask yourself, what is an entry? An entry into a confined space is any time any part of our body breaks the plane of entry. So if, you're, if it's a manhole, an opening there, if I reach my hand in to turn a valve, that is technically a confined space entry under OSHA. Um, so if I stick my head in, is that dangerous? Well, yeah, if the bad stuff's in there, it doesn't matter whether my whole body or just my head's in there, it can be dangerous to me. So, so any entry, any time any part of our body is placed into that space, it's an entry. So you say, what the heck is a confined space? I just signed up for this webinar because I didn't know what confined space was. Well, a confined space, this is the OSHA definition, is one that is big enough to get into, to enter. So I can climb into a manhole, a tank, a pit, a vault. It's big enough to get into. It has limited means of entry and egress. What does that mean? It means it's hard to get into. It means, it, it means I have to climb through a, a manway or uh, I have to use a ladder to get into this place. It's not a closet. Uh, as, much as, as much as Cecilia says hers is a confined space, that closet isn't because it's, it, because it's designed for human occupancy. Um, and that's the last one. It's not designed for continuous employee occupancy. You could put a desk in there and work in that closet and you'd be okay. But a, but a confined space is something like this list, a manhole, uh, tank, crawl space, pits, vaults, ducts, lift stations, bag houses, attics, 
um, digesters at a wastewater treatment facility. These, uh, these are um, definitions or examples of spaces that OSHA put out when they updated their confined space standard for construction a few years ago because there were always a lot of questions. Is this a confined space? And they said, yeah, here's, the, here's a list of these places. If you think about an attic, is that a confined space? Well, it definitely can be. So it probably meets the, meets the list. And so we have to evaluate that. All right, then the question is, is what makes it a permit required confined space? Because if it's not a permit required, I don't have the OSHA requirements for that. Doesn't necessarily mean that it, that it is not a potentially dangerous location, but it doesn't meet the, uh, meet the OSHA definition. So here's the OSHA, de OSHA, OSHA definition. It has the potential, it contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Well, potential to contain, what could that be? Well, unfortunately, we've had, we've had a, an employee of uh, one of our members um, pass away in a confined space, and it was a pretty simple box. It was a pressure relief valve or a meter vault, and, and it didn't have any obvious signs of hazard. The thing that was, that was lethal to this employee was a low oxygen state. Over time, this because of the configuration of this vault, it didn't have good ventilation, and the rust that was taking place on the metal parts in the vault and and microbial action that's taking place consumed the oxygen in the in the space to the point where where when this employee walked, climbed down into there, he was overcome because there wasn't there wasn't enough oxygen to support his life. So it really opens it up to many of our spaces that traditionally we may have thought, ah, it's just a box, we're okay, no worries about this one. So has, it contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere, contains a material that has the potential for engulfing an entrant. Well, what materials could engulf an entrant? Well, that could be water, sewage, um, concrete in a, in a cement truck, um, gravel in a in a uh, hopper, grain in a silo, any of these things could potentially engulf an entrance. So you think about water engulfment or a solid material like uh, like grain or gravel that could engulf them. As an internal configuration that could trap or asphyxiate an entrant. So if you've got a if you've got a cone bottom tank or some a bunch of pipes in there where somebody could become entrapped. Um, or could they could be crushed to a point where they would asphyxiate, where they couldn't breathe? Or here's the here's the catch-all that OSHA throws in there: contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazard. Well, that's pretty that's pretty broad. Um, maybe we can dial that in a little bit more by saying open electrical, rotating parts and shafts, serious serious fall hazards, or any other serious hazard that's out there. That doesn't mean if there's a splinter in there that you have to have to include that, but uh, but something that's serious. If if you got tangled up in this or that, um, it could be a real problem inside of a confined space because those hazards get to be a lot worse in a confined space. All right, so we decide we're going to go into confined spaces. We have to have a written policy around this, a program, and. Uh, <clears throat> And here are a few elements. We'll go through each one of these um, individually, but uh, but just to, just for a second, we'll talk about a program, a written program that has a permit. So we can come up with our permit. OSHA has a sample permit, but you can create your own as long as it can, as long as it uh, contains the elements required by the OSHA standard. <clears throat> but we also need to have a list of our confined spaces. Um, identifying what the space is and potential hazards that are involved there and any specific specific procedures that we have to do for that individual space. People say, are you kidding me? We've got, we've got a thousand sewer manholes out here. Do I need to have that list? And the answer is yes. Um, and most of you can get that list from, from your GIS um, system or you've got them on a spreadsheet somewhere and you can create that list. Um, the amount of detail that you have to put on there for, for sewer manholes may not be a lot. They, they can be a carbon copy for a lot of those, but if you've got a problem space, 
um, then you want to uh, put that in detail in there that says this space always has hydrogen sulfide. We have to ventilate this really well. Or um, you need to isolate this energy source prior, prior to entering into this space. Okay. Let's go through each one of these elements. The first one is a competent person. Um, I told you that, uh, that OSHA updated their, their um, or promulgated a construction version of the confined, confined space entry, permit required confined space entry standard. Um, and when they did this, they sought to correct some of the issues that they had with the general industry standard. One of those um, is what they've done in many of the construction standards, and it required to have a competent person available um, that gives information and understands what to do about confined spaces. And so what is a competent person? Well, the OSHA definition is there, but it really boils down to they have knowledge. This is somebody that understands the hazards of a confined space, and they also have the authority to do something about it, um, to buy equipment, to pull people out or not allow people in, cancel permits. The, the competent person is essential there, and each of your organizations should have somebody designated as a competent person. If you don't have somebody trained up to that level that they have that knowledge, then you should work on that. Um, question just popped up. Uh, can I get a copy of the slides? Absolutely. Um, I will make a PDF of the slides and send those out um, after as we uh, send out the notice that the that the recording is available on our website as well. And you can always go back and, and watch this recording again if you want to if, if you wanted to dial in a little closer on something that I said. Competent person responsibilities. Um, they they're responsible for determining whether confined spaces exist identifying which of those spaces are permit required spaces, um, looking at alternate entry procedures. Now there are, there is an exemption or an angle in the, in the OSHA standard that allows us to come up with alternate entry procedures for spaces that normally would be permit required, but because the only hazard in there is the potential to have a hazardous atmosphere, um, if that can be handled by, by testing and ventilation, um, we can come up with alternate entry procedures. Now, I caution you in doing that. We can't do this for a sewer manhole because there are more hazards there than just that, that hazardous atmosphere. Um, and be very careful about just diving in and saying, oh, alternate entry, we don't have to worry about it. There is some due diligence that you have to do to ensure that, that, that this is appropriate for that. And definitely, if you're considering alternate entry um, into these spaces, contact, contact Doug, Brent, or myself, and we'll be happy to walk you through the process of doing that and give you, and give you some ideas on um, what's appropriate and what isn't uh, when it comes to alternate entry. The competent person has the responsibility to ensure that the program is followed, that that written program is, is done correctly every time. And that's where I think sometimes we get in, in trouble. We have the equipment. We have the... Um, we have the training and all of that, but sometimes it's, I'm in a hurry. And people, people will put themselves, put their lives at risk because they're in a hurry and they don't do all of the, all of the steps that need to be done. Uh, the next part is the entry team. We have specific responsibilities in confined space entry. And, uh, and, and here's a list of, of each of those from entrance all the way down to contractors. So let's talk about each of those. Um, an authorized entrant is somebody who is authorized, meaning that you can't go into a confined space unless you've been authorized by the employer to do that. Um, to be authorized, you need to be trained. You need to know what hazards are present in the space. You need to know how to use the equipment properly, everything from a gas, uh, from a gas detector to your ventilation to um, your, ex your extraction equipment, to how, to wear a, how to wear a full body harness um, and what to do. If your alarm goes off on your meter, um, they need to be able to communicate at all times with the attendant. Um, and that can be accomplished in various different ways from radios to verbal communication to sometimes it's a, it's a set of um, signals that we use on, uh, on the uh, rope that they're tied onto to give somebody to let somebody know I'm okay or let somebody know they need to get out of that space. 
they need to alert the attendant of prohibited conditions. If something goes, goes on that, that is not okay under the permit, they need to let the attendant know so proper decisions can be made. And they need to exit the space if necessary. If your meter, if the alarm on your meter goes off, you need to get out. Don't hang around. Uh, don't tighten up those last bolts. Get out. This is an emergency and, uh, and you take appropriate action. If the attendant tells you to get out, get out. So the attendant stays outside of the space <clears throat> at all times. They, they may not enter the space and their job is to keep track of what's going on in the, in the entry and keep track of the entrance. They need to maintain communication both with the entrance as well as have a, the ability to communicate with emergency services and be able to summon them if something goes wrong. <clears throat> Um, they need to keep people away from confined spaces that aren't supposed to be there. They also watch and monitor the, the uh, gas levels uh, for oxygen, for, for explosives and toxics that might be in there. And they also have the responsibility to perform non-entry rescue if, uh, if somebody has a problem. And, and this problem might be something different than, than just somebody has, or than not just, but then if somebody has a, a low oxygen scenario, somebody might have a heart attack. Somebody might have, they might slip and fall or have some other type of emergency and need to be removed from there. So they can perform that non-entry rescue, which is simply cranking somebody out. Um, in addition to this, and I'll talk about it in rescue, they need to be trained um, to in CPR and first aid so that when when or if something bad like this happens, they can perform, they can render aid. So if somebody has a heart attack and they're not breathing, their heart's not working, you can crank them out, but if you can't perform CPR, um, then they may not make it anyway. So if you're performing these attendant duties, you should have some additional training in, in CPR and first aid. An entry supervisor is the boss. This is the person that determines if, a, if an entry will happen. So they make sure that all of, the, all of the conditions are satisfied prior to people going in. They make sure that the, the hazards are identified and people are, trained, people are notified of what they're going to be dealing with. They verify the rescue service. What does that mean? For most of us out there, the rescue service that we're using is the local fire department. How do, you notify, how do you verify the rescue services? Well, you call up the fire department and you say, we're going to be cleaning manholes in this section of town today, and, uh, and we may be making confined space entries, or we will be entering the water tank to do this. Um, and you verify that those services are available. If the, if the emergency services or rescue services are not available, um, then your job is to prevent that entry from taking place. If we don't have, if we don't have rescue services, we can't go in. Okay. Um, the, the supervisor also has the has responsibility to terminate an entry and cancel a permit if we go outside of what is uh, what those conditions, acceptable conditions are in the permit. Um, they monitor the environment, monitor the other uh, the other entrance there. And, uh, and let people know if there's something that's not, not right. Hey, our gas levels are starting to change. Our oxygen level is going down or we're starting to see some carbon monoxide show up in the in space. All right, let's just take a little, uh, a little diversion here uh, on rescue services. And like we said, most people expect the local fire department to be their rescue services. You need to ask and communicate with the fire department about this and say, Will you, can you provide technical rescue in a confined space? Is this something that you're trained and, and capable of doing? Because many of you, many out there think that, well, it's fire department, they can do this. That is not necessarily the case. Ask the question and, uh, and know what their capabilities are. Many times confined space and trenching rescue are not done by an individual department they're done at a county basis where they bring in resources from, from various different departments. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that if you go into a, go into a confined space and you don't have enough oxygen to breathe, it's gonna take maybe a half hour for them to get all the resources on, on site. So I'll ask you the question, how long can you hold your breath? We need to do this right. 
Um, we need to have we need to have um, additional sources of rescue available, and we need to do those basic things: have good ventilation, check the air, all of those things. Because I don't want to rely on those rescue services. I want to have multiple things ahead of them um, that I can that I can be rescued or get myself out prior to that happening. So verify those those rescue services. Okay. Doug, I'll ask you, can you see, is the video coming through? Yeah, it's... Um, is it choppy? It's a little choppy, but yeah. I didn't leave the video, many videos in, <laughs> but I just thought this was a, a, good, a good rescue video dragging that poor guy out. So standby rescue, um, having people available to do that, and they come in various different ways. Here's, here's the different types of rescue. Self-rescue is obviously the best way. My meter goes off or something's not quite right in that space, I get myself out. I identify the, identify the problem and get out. That's probably the best way um, because you're getting out under your own power and, you can, and, and you've identified the problem in time to, to take action. The second best is non-entry rescue, and that's from somebody <clears throat> um, somebody outside the space, generally the attendant, um, that will help you out. And like we said, this person that is uh, that will be doing that non-entry rescue needs to be trained on CPR and first aid. Um, well, to be able to be able to have that non-entry rescue happen, you have to be tied on so we can we can use that winch to pull you out. So in the permit required confined space entry standard. Um, there's a requirement in there that everybody that goes in needs to be tied off to a full body harness. Um, there's only a very limited exemption, and that's if that's if that that lifeline or the PP itself could make it more dangerous than not using it. That's a pretty limited. Um, there there are very limited cases where that would happen. That would be something where you're calling up and over and around and through pipes. And, and you just physically could not extract that person or you've got rotating parts that could get tangled into the, um, into the retrieval line. I just don't see this as, as being an exemption that most of us would ever use. If you go in, have that harness on and be tied off. So a retrieval line, that's something that should be, uh, that um, in many cases we'll use that winch line, but in a lot of cases we have more people than than, than what we have on that winch line. And so we can use a retrieval line, which is a rope um, similar, if you, think about, uh, if you think about rock climbing rope, something that is, that is designed for this type of work, and you need to have a way to hook onto that and pull that person out, and everybody should be tied off. Oh, and that retrieval line should be tied to a, a fixed point so you can't pull it in. Um, I'd recommend that you don't tie that to a receiver hitch on the truck, though. That uh, that could be bad. Um, if you're over five, if you're in a space that's five feet deep or more, you need to have a mechanical device to extricate the worker. So that could be uh, that could be that tripod and uh, winch system. Um, there are various different ways that you can accomplish this. And if you have questions about specific specific instances. Let us know, and we, we'd be happy to take a look and, and, and help to guide you, guide you to the appropriate equipment for that. Um, entry rescue. This is, this is what we think of when the fire department shows up and they go in to enter. If you're not trained, if you're not, if you're not equipped to be able to do this, um, don't enter that space. You could become one of those statistics where, uh, where better than 50% of the fatalities that happen are rescuers, people that are going in to save somebody else. Get the right people there. Um, ensure that your ensure that your rescue service is capable of doing that, and you need to give them an opportunity to access your spaces at least once per year. Well, we know that can't be possible at all times because some of you have water tanks that you enter maybe once every 10 years to do some maintenance or cleaning. And so you don't really have that access. Well, um, when you do have that <clears throat> take place, call up your rescue services and say, hey, we're going to be doing this entry here, and uh, we want to make sure that you have access so you can figure out how to do that, how to enter that. 
in most cases, the rescue services, fire department says, we know what a sewer manhole looks like. We're not worried about that. We, we uh, know how to uh, get, people, get people out of a, a sewer manhole. Um, however, other spaces may be a lot more challenging. I had one at one time that was a, it was a vertical um, chilling, t or uh, <laughs> losing my, uh, lost my uh, train of thought on that, cooling tower or chiller that we called it. And so, and so it had this big vertical sides <clears throat> and inside of it had a lot of pipes going back and forth. It was for a refrigeration system. And so there were anhydrous ammonia lines in there as well as a lot of water, fans. Um, it was a pretty technical space. And the manway where you would enter into this space was up on the side. It was about mm, eight feet high and on the side of and, and on the side of this cooling tower. Well, it's it was a space that you can't put a tripod on. How are we going to get people out? Well, we brought the fire department out and said, okay, here's our space. How, uh, how would you propose rescuing somebody that goes down inside of this, inside of this cooling tower? And after a little bit of, uh, of talking back and forth, the solution that we, that we all settled on was take a sawzall and cut a hole in the side of, the, uh, in the side of this metal uh, cooling tower and we actually identified places where <clears throat> um, places where it would be safe to do that, and not uh, not cut into any piping and cause more of a problem than we initially started with. And we marked that on the marked that on the cooling tower. So working together can help us make it make a rescue as smooth as possible. We don't want it to happen, but if it does, we want to make sure that that we're working together, and we plan for all of the problems that could that could happen. All right. Um, I want to run through hazardous atmospheres quickly because because your meter, your gas detector, is your lifeline. This is the thing that can that can be the difference between life and death. And so you need to know how to use this. You need to make sure it's working correctly, and you need to know what it reads. A four gas meter, confined space entry meter, reads just that. Four different uh, four different things, and we'll talk about each one of those. Two of these. Uh, <clears throat> Two of these are related to oxygen, and they are um, oxygen deficiency or oxygen enriched environments. And, and you say, well, can you have too much oxygen? And the answer is yes. It can cause problems with flammability. It becomes, um, as its oxidizer properties can cause things to burn that don't normally burn or burn a lot hotter than they would. So let's run through each one of these things um, as we uh, as we talk about hazardous, and just a reminder on this, hazardous atmospheres um, can can be um, created by a lot of different things. It can be naturally created um, as uh, as our wastes go down through the sewer system. They're releasing gases. There's methane and hydrogen sulfide that comes off of that. That's consuming oxygen as the wastes go along there. Or they could be things <clears throat> that we do. To cause uh, to cause a, a hazardous atmosphere, like starting up a gas-fired motor and, and uh, filling this space with carbon monoxide, or like we talked before, bringing some lacquer thinner into a space and concentrating that. So realize that you may be your own worst enemy in many cases. Um, interesting video. I hope it's coming through. <clears throat> Wow, know what you're dealing with. So your meter is your lifeline. It's a simple electronic device. How do I know that this is working correctly? Well, it needs to be calibrated. Now it'll come calibrated from the, uh, from the factory to start with, but you need to verify this every time you use it. And we, and, and we call that a bump test. And I did a, there's a, a YouTube video that I've done on performing a bump test. It's on our, it's on our channel there. So it's specific to that. I won't spend a lot of time because this is a, uh, this is a quick video that we're doing today, but I'm going to take a cylinder of a known, of a known gas. And it says right on here what that, uh, what the concentration is. And I'm going to expose it to the sensors on this meter. 
with this one here I do it with uh, there's a pump that I use to be able to test at uh, different levels in a confined space and I hook it up if it reads the same as what it uh, if the meter reads the same as what it does on the cylinders I'm good to go uh, I pass my bump test if it doesn't I need to recalibrate if I recalibrate, does that mean mean I need to send it back to the back to the supplier or the manufacturer? The answer is no. You can do your own calibration. You need this you need this <clears throat> cylinder of calibration gas, and you need your owner's manual to take you through. My recommendation is that you have one person in your organization that is the that is the meter guru, the person that you go to. Hey, this meter needs to be recalibrated. And they've they've taken the time to learn this. It's not a it's not a difficult process, but uh, but I recommend that you have one person that really learns that, and uh, and they can handle that. If you have questions, your uh, your manufacturer or the uh, generally the company that you buy this uh, buy your meter from can help you out on on training for calibrating your specific meter. This is one area where I definitely recommend. Um, if you're buying this type of equipment, I would buy it from a local supplier. Why is that? Well, if I have a problem, I can walk down to the local supplier and say, help me calibrate this thing. I, I'm not quite sure um, that I'm getting this right. And generally, everybody that sells this type of stuff um, provides some, some sort of service. Um, and if you need a new, a new sensor, you can go to them and not have to send it off to, uh, to someplace unknown. It might take a long time. We want to have a meter that works at all times, and so and so have have support there close and have people that know what they're doing. <clears throat> Just a couple of reminders on this. I talked about the I talked about using a using a pump and a hose. If I'm getting into a sewer manhole, I definitely need to know what the concentration of the various gases are at different levels right up at the street level as well as right down at the bottom because it can vary widely. Um, air becomes stratified and uh, there may be a layer in there that is toxic and the rest of it is okay. So definitely test it at various levels, at least top, middle, and bottom. But if it's a really tall space, I'm gonna be testing a lot more and it takes a little bit of time to test that space and allow those, those sensors to react. Um, oxygen. So let's go through the, the, the different gases, four gases in this, in this meter. Oxygen deficient and oxygen rich atmospheres. Um, if you look at your meter, it should be reading 20.9% oxygen. That is, the, that is the natural concentration, the natural state of oxygen in our atmosphere. If it's less than that, that can put us at risk. If you've ever held your breath for any length of time, you can understand an oxygen deficient atmosphere. So if, it's, if your meter says less than 19.5% oxygen, that means it's oxygen deficient. If it says it's more than 23.5, that means it's oxygen enriched. There's too much oxygen. Now there's another special level that we talk about, and that's the IDLH, or the immediately dangerous to life and health concentration. Anything less than 16% oxygen, you could die be disabled or not be able to get yourself out of out of this environment um, and so really the the window that we look at is between 19 and a half and 23 and a half percent oxygen but let me tell you what I want to be dead on 19 and a half or excuse me on 20.9 percent oxygen I want to ventilate that space until it's natural concentration because if I'm at 19.6 well I know I'm very close to being oxygen deficient. I want to, to ventilate the space and make it safe for me to go in. <clears throat> um, when we talk about oxygen um, enrichment, the, the big hazard, I can breathe 100% oxygen and not have any, any real serious physiological hazards happen. But if, I, but if I allow oxygen to be enriched in the environment around me, things, things like my clothing can become very flammable, and so and so these videos that are running here just just show how simple oxygen tubing can catch on fire easily when it's exposed to pure oxygen. So we never use pure oxygen as as a source of ventilation, 
And we also want to make sure that if we're using um, oxygen in any of the operations around, that it doesn't become enriched because burning to death is a really bad way to go. We always, <clears throat> we always measure oxygen first. That's essential for life. And it's also essential for some of these other, other uh, sensors to work appropriately. So measure oxygen first um, and make sure it's within that 19.5 to 23.5% window. Uh, realize that on these meters, sometimes these sensors are only good for about a year. And so you want to, you want to as you purchase these, ask the, ask the supplier, what's the guarantee on the sensors? You can buy meters that have sensors that are guaranteed for up to five years. And I would recommend that um, just because a year can go really quickly. All right, the next thing that we measure is, is the percent of the LEL or lower explosive limit. Um, this is for flammability. As we, uh, as we use flammable materials, or maybe we have naturally occurring methane in a, in a sewer manhole, those can cause fires or explosions. And, uh, and so we're going, to measure, we're going to measure that. And if your meter reads over 10% of the lower explosive limit, which is the, the concentration at which it can support combustion, your, meter's gonna, your alarm's going to go off, and you need to get out of there. Why do we do it at 10% and not 50% or, or 90%? Well, because burning to death is a really bad way to go. And things change quickly in a confined space. It's concentrated. And so, and so at 10%, that means get your butt out of there. Um, <clears throat> as we deal, deal with flammables, we talk about the flat fire triangle. What does it take to make a fire? Well, it takes heat, oxygen, and fuel. So if I've got a flammable material in there and I have oxygen, all I need is a spark. So anytime I'm working about around these flammable materials, I need to have non-sparking tools and the, and the electronic equipment that I have in there needs to be what, what we call intrinsically safe. This meter, if you read on the back, says it's intrinsically safe for hazardous atmospheres. My phone doesn't have that same, doesn't have that same intrinsic safety. So realize that that may, be a, uh, that may be a hazard in a space if I have um, flammables. If you have a ton of flammables, I look out the window here and I can see, I can see the uh, refineries here in North Salt Lake. If they go into a, into a gasoline storage tank, they're not going to pump oxygen into there. They're actually going to inert the space, put nitrogen gas in there so it won't support combustion um, and, prevent, and prevent that explosion or fire from happening. What does that do for our responders? That means that they've got to take their air in with them. So they wear an, an SCBA or an airline respirator so they have sufficient oxygen. All right. Just a couple of quick videos on that. Um, these explosions and fires can be, can be lethal. And play the videos just because those are things that uh, um, can help help everybody understand just how important it is to test and ventilate these uh, these spaces. So read your percent LEL. If it's if it's 10 percent or above, get out and uh, figure out what's going on. We have two other we have two other sensors on a four gas meter, and sometimes you can have a five, but generally a confined space meter will have these two other um, toxics: carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide. <clears throat> And these are both toxic, um, toxic materials that can have other properties as well. Let's talk about carbon monoxide. This is an incomplete combustion product um, of fuels, of organic materials. So if I start a motor inside of there or I have something burning, it can produce carbon monoxide. I can't see it. I can't smell it. I can't taste it. And so my meter is the only way I can identify it. Um, as you read on your meter, the permissible exposure limit is 50 parts per million, but your meter will probably go off at 25 parts per million, which is the threshold limit value, which is a little bit better number for us from safety, <clears throat> uh, from a safety standpoint. Um, and once again, don't be starting up a, a, a cutoff saw or a generator inside or near these confined spaces that can cause a buildup of, of carbon monoxide. Hydrogen sulfide is what we call rotten egg gas. And you can smell this if, you, if you've driven out through the basin, out through, out through you in a basin where they have oil fields, you'll smell this. It smells like rotten egg gas. 
Um, in addition, you can find it in, in sewer manholes and sewer systems. Um, and you can smell it at low concentrations. At high concentrations, it turns our smeller off. It makes it so uh, we have what they call olfactory fatigue. I can't smell it anymore, and I may not know <clears throat> I may not know um, that I'm being exposed to it. It will cause you cause your heart to palpitate, and you'll stop breathing, and this stuff will just kill you. It's also it's also flammable as well. Twenty parts per million is a ceiling concentration. Your meter will go off at, at 10 parts per million generally on, on this to let you know <clears throat> that it's inappropriate to stay in a confined space with, with hydrogen sulfide. All right, just, to, just a reminder on <clears throat> other toxics. If you have chlorine in a space, that four gas meter isn't going to tell you that chlorine is there. So if I know I'm going to be dealing with that, I can buy another single gas meter. These aren't terribly expensive, $150, $200, and, uh, and I can tell the concentration of what that is. I need to know what the, the permissible exposure limits are um, for that so I can keep myself safe, but, uh, it, but realize that this four gas meter, if it's not one of those four gases, it's not going to tell you it's there, so I need to know what I'm dealing with. And if you have questions, definitely, definitely give us a call on any of these things. We're happy to help out with that. I found a, I found a, a video of, of how to do ventilation. <laughs> Pretty crazy. We live, in a, we live in a good time. We have great equipment. It's relatively cheap. Um, I said how much a single gas, four gas meter. You can probably get these from $500 if you, up to five to $700. If you uh, buy all of the equipment and the calibration gas to go along with it, plan for uh, up to $1,500, but it's not crazy expensive, especially when your life is, is on the line. Let's talk about ventilation quickly. Um, ventilation is essential to confined space entry. We do this in a couple of different ways. Um, one, is, uh, one is called dilution ventilation, where I dump a whole bunch of clean air in the other is, is called local exhaust. So maybe I've got something bad that's releasing some bad gases inside of that space. I can, I can put a duct right by that and, and ventilate that out so it doesn't fill the atmosphere where I'm going to be entering. Now, if I'm doing local exhaust, I'm probably going to be doing dilution ventilation at the same time. Once again, don't ever use pure oxygen for this because, it, because that can cause you to blow up. Um, but these systems are, are, are fairly simple. You can have those hooked up to AC power or you can hook them up, hook them up to the battery of your truck and, uh, and they will blow a significant amount of air. Now, just because you have a fan doesn't mean it will handle all spaces. If you've got a, if you've got a tunnel that's a mile long, that ventilation is not going, a single, a single fan is not going to handle that mile long space. It needs to be appropriate for this, the size and configuration of what we're dealing with. Um, so air replacement, this is a dilution ventilation I talk about, just dumping a bunch of clean air in to make it safe for us. Local exhaust takes the bad stuff out. Other hazards in a confined space um, could be electrical, mechanical, engulfment from water, sewage, um, drain, whatever it may be. Um, temperature extremes can happen in a confined space, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, um, a hazard that may not be uh, of particular concern outside of a confined, confined space becomes a really, a really dangerous thing because it's confined. It can concentrate the gases. It can put you in close proximity to these hazards where you can't easily or safely get out. And so we need to evaluate all of those hazards prior to going in. And, and put those on our entry permit. I haven't spent a lot of time talking about that permit, but that's, a, that's an essential document, um, not only to meet the OSHA obligation, but it, to help make sure that you, you have um, identified all the hazards and you've done everything to make it safe to get into that space. Um, huh, wow, I'm having a few issues with my keynote today, kicking out, all right. Um, 
isolation. If I have if I have an energy source, whether it's electrical or high pressure or mechanical moving parts, I need to isolate those before going in. So lockout, tagout may be a part of of the requirements of that permit to go into the confined space. There were some changes um, uh, in when OSHA updated the the construction standard for permit required confined space entry. Um, requiring continuous air monitoring. So it used to be that we could we could just check and then periodically go back and check. Well, technology is, has come a long way since then. The batteries last a long time, um, and we can we can continuously monitor this space. So um, depending on the type of space, if it's bigger than bigger than just a, a simple vault. Um, where people are going down through a tunnel or something like that, I may actually have multiple meters um, on different people. In addition to the attendant outside, the actual individual entrance can wear these meters as well. They've gotten really small, and you can simply wear those um, wear those on your on your clothing, and it will let you know immediately if something happens. Um, continuous monitoring of engulfment hazards. What does that mean? Well. Um, probably the probably one of the better examples that I could think of is in southern Utah, where we where we have the potential for flash and flash floods can happen anywhere. But southern Utah has a lot of flash floods. If you're entering into a storm drain um, to do some work and and there's and you know there's a potential for engulfment hazards like flash floods happening, you have a requirement for continuous monitoring. Well, how do I monitor that? Well, I'm going to be monitoring National Weather Service uh, alerts and various things like that and monitoring the weather so I know what's coming. Sometimes sometimes these flash floods can happen several miles away and uh, or the rain event can happen several miles away and then this flood comes down and, and uh, could engulf us. So that monitoring is important. Um, emergency response must notify if they cannot respond promptly. And so that, that uh, requires us to notify them and they can say, hey, we've got wildland fires going and we can't get away from, uh, get away from this to respond to a confined space entry. So guess what? Today's not a day we can do a confined space entry. Um, one thing that I skipped, I don't know if, my, if I missed that slide or, or what happened. I, did, I skipped talking about contractors. Um, contractors are part of our entry team, and a lot of times we hire them to do jobs along with us. We need to verify that they have a have a program and policy that's at least as stringent as what we do, and uh, and we also need to keep track of these guys. And you say, well, that's why I hire hire a contractor so I don't have to keep track of them. As the as the lead employer um, on this job site you have the responsibility to ensure that they're doing things right. So watch and, uh, and, and forget OSHA, you know, totally take that out of there. We don't want people dying. Um, we want to keep people safe on our job sites. So if you see a contractor that's cutting the corners, make sure that, they, that we take action and, and pull those people out and let them know if you don't do this right, we don't want you on our job. If you have, if you have repeated problems with the contractor, don't give them the job. This is a this is a uh, a great way to say you know what we're not going to give you the bid for this because because on multiple occasions you you have bypassed safety requirements use this as use this as some good leverage to get our contractors um, doing things correctly and helping to keep you safe on the job so just in a, a quick summary here know your spaces know what you're dealing with have that list. Test and ventilate. That's so such an important part of, of this overall program. Make sure your meter works. Test it, bump test it, calibrate it if it's not working right. Know what those know what those numbers mean on your meter. So when you read it, even if there is an alarm going off and it's 19.6, then you know that ooh, I'm pretty darn close to being an oxygen deficient atmosphere. Um, stick to your permit entry roles. Attendants don't go in the don't go in the space. Do things right. Have that competent person assigned, so so they take the responsibility of of doing this program right. Evaluate your emergency services and make sure that they are capable of doing this. If they can't, we've got to work on getting services that 
um, that can do that. And if that means training up the fire department, getting them some equipment, so be it. Um, if it means hiring an, an outside service, that may be the direction you need to go. In, in, at, at the end of it all, think, think, think. This is something that, uh, that can kill us if we're not thinking. So every day as we go out and do our task, let's be, let's be watching for tasks similar to confined space entry that can kill us if we don't do everything right. Um, if you have questions about this, give us a call. Doug, Brent, and myself are all more than happy um, to run through this with you on the phone. If you need, a, need us to evaluate, uh, evaluate given situations, we're happy to do that as well. Um, at the end of the day, we want you guys to be safe out there. We want you to, um, to do things right so you can go home at the end of the day and, and, uh, and keep all your fingers and toes and, and, and stay alive to, to go and see your families. <sighs> That was a lot of words. I spent. I, I knew it was going to be tough to get that done in an hour's time, and I did it. <laughs> um, but I appreciate uh, appreciate your attendance here. Uh, are there any questions? Um, you can go ahead and type those into the chat box or the Q and A box, and I'd be happy to answer those. Doug and Brent, did I did I miss anything? Something. Jason, you did it. Fifty-nine I, minutes. You did it. I did. <laughs> yeah. It was great. This is generally a two-hour training at minimum, and uh, and so we just we just rammed through this. Realized that uh, we'll go into more detail in in December as we're as we're doing this on a regional uh, a regional tour. Um, but uh, give us a call. Let us know if there's questions. I don't see any questions. I just remind everybody out there that if you're using this. Uh, this broadcast, this recording for training your employees, uh, they need to have an opportunity to ask any questions that they have and have some interaction there. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, any, of the th any of the topics covered in this training, make sure and give us a call uh, so that we can help you make sure your employees and your questions are answered so that you're doing this right, because this is a killer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Thanks, folks, for, for all you do out there. We appreciate all of the work that you do, keeping making our communities better. Let's just do it in a safe way so everybody, everybody goes home safe. All right, folks, everybody go out and have a safe day. Thanks.